All right, hello everyone. Hello everyone. And just setting up here, making sure I got everything going. So we're gonna do some more bug stuff today. So I hope you're excited, you know I am. Um, and I wanna start with just talking about where I left off last time. So last Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, I did a live stream and I focused mostly on the four wings and doing the wing veining. That was the primary thing. So um, rather than, well, the next step is to work on the hind wings, right? And the hind wings are the same idea. They're gonna have wing veins and that kind of stuff. So rather than kind of rehash what I did last week, because I, I wanna keep moving forward on this, what I did is uh, I worked on the hind wings and here they are. And I also changed the legs because I wasn't really happy with the way the legs looked. I'm still not totally happy with them, but I think these are better than what they were last week. This is the legs last week, which I thought was kind of boring. And this is the legs this week, which I think is a little bit more interesting. I'm still kind of messing with the proportions, but I really want to focus on detailing today. However, I know there's some people who really do want to see like every step of the process and they don't want to miss anything. So what I did is I recorded a uh, video and post it on YouTube if you wanna see how I did the hind wing. So it's kind of like a time lapse and also what I did on the legs. And so if you go to my YouTube channel, which is uh, at Blue Patone, um, so my YouTube channel is uh, at Blue Patone right here, um, you can see I recorded this video and I know I'm doing a YouTube of a YouTube, but it kind of goes through the process of what I did with the wings. So it's a nice review and you'll also see some uh, how I did the veins. This is a review of how I do wing veins for insects. And then also the changes that I made to the legs. So if you want to check that out on my YouTube channel, please feel free to do that. Otherwise, I'm going to go forward and we're going to talk about detailing today, which is actually like one of my favorite parts of the entire uh, process. Um, I love detailing. That's why I got into ZBrush in the first place. And as usual, I'm going to start with the head. And um, now I did some detailing a while back, a little bit, but I want to get more into it. So let's take a look at some models I've done in the past just to see, you know, where we're headed. Uh, and then I want to say a few things about bugs in general. There's lots of different ways that you can detail your bug uh, models. <clears throat> Since I do spend a lot of time trying to accurately model real bugs in the real world, you get a lot of inspiration. So here is a rainbow scarab beetle I did a few years ago. And uh, this is an actual living organism. It's a type of dung beetle. It's really wild looking. It's also very colorful. But you notice the detailing on it is really interesting. Um, it's got this kind of like weird kind of wormy structure on the surface, you know, that is kind of fun. You know, you can see this in the head and the, um, uh, the other parts. Um, of the front of the beetle but then if you look at like this big horn you can see that it has kind of a characteristic pitting that you'll see in a lot of uh, insects if you look really close at them and you see that this one you know i was trying to kind of do an analysis of how these details work this one has kind of a mixture of very fine details and then kind of somewhat uniform uh similar size larger pits that are randomly placed but somewhat evenly spaced in other words you don't see two of them like really close together or really far apart they're almost sort of equidistant. and i do a little smoothing here to kind of indicate wear and tear so when you're looking at bugs look for those kinds of interesting patterns and you can come up with your own rules for how the insect detailing works so if you look at the elytra here on this uh, beetle you can see it's very different from what we see in the front of the head this is kind of like a more of a squiggly stripe with some noise in between and i use a lot of surface noise to get these kinds of effect and i'll do that tonight as well as i work on the wasp and then you can see on the other underside beetles are really wild they're very complex especially the underside you get a, a wide variety of details it's not just the same thing over the entire model it changes depending on where what part of the anatomy we're looking at so let me go down here real quick and turn off some of these textures this is just the colors you see here are just the uv texture thing so i'm going to go down here 
to textures and I'm going to turn off textures and then go down here and apply last function to all subtools and hopefully it'll turn them all off. But you can see like we have like large pits right here with some noise and we have kind of a combination of sort of stripiness and then maybe a, like a finer noise on these parts right here and then the parts of the mouth. This one has such a wild mouth that it's worth uh, taking a look at. You know, it's like everything is under the shield. It's almost like a horseshoe crab in the, in the fact that we have this large carapace and then a lot of the details underneath. And check out the antenna on this stuff. It's really crazy, and I'm not making this up. You know, I actually got some of these. I ordered them, you know, dead ones in the mail, um, and then, you know, looked at them under a microscope, and I spent a lot of time on this. Notice that half of the eye is visible underneath, and then the other half is visible above, which is really wild. So I think the world looks very strange to these beetles. So um, some cool stuff there for inspiration. And then one of my favorites, of course, is the uh, Acromermex, which is basically a leaf cutter ant. Let me see if we can find it here. That is, that's our wasp. Hold a version of the wasp. Uh, here's a Katie did. Um, let's take a look at this. And again, I'm gonna go texture map, texture off to turn it off, and then subtools. Apply last action to all subtools, meaning turn off all the textures for all the subtools. So this is one that I did for actually a VR project a while back for an Italian university. So it's kind of a VR exploration of a tree and all the different life forms that live on the tree. Um, so you can see in this case, we see a lot of very fine detail on here and some kind of cracks and that kind of stuff, especially around these areas around the eyes. You can see this kind of detail right here which is a lot of fun to sculpt but you know the detail has a personality to it we look at the wings you can see all the little sculpted detail that i did on here as well as some of the fine detail and again used a lot of noise noise plug-in surface noise uh, to do this kind of stuff so we'll do be doing some of that so some cool inspiration there on this katie did they're really cool insects one of my favorites um, kind of related to grasshoppers you can find the really huge ones in Indonesia let's see and then we have this one it's uh, give me a second and this of course is a cicada and uh, lots of cool detail on here Uh, nice inspiration. That's why I think it's a great idea to really spend some time doing some bugs and trying to get them as accurate as possible. Looking at the um, the underside of the abdomen here, you have a combination of this noise, but you see these streaks kind of imply a little bit of attention as you know, you know, as these bugs grow, they 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 molt every so many. Uh, stages the stages are called instars so the stage in between a molt is called an instar and depending on the type of bugs like you don't see a lot of ants molting uh, adult ants molting but adult uh, other bugs like cicadas and stuff um, you'll see their molts and everything and and so as the bug is aging of course it's getting bigger and at a certain point it outgrows its exoskeleton and that's when it molts it kind of sheds that and then emerges and develops a new exoskeleton. So you kind of want to imply this tension of this growing and this expanding of the exoskeleton in your details and your bugs. I mean, it almost looks kind of like you see muscular detail on a fleshy character or a monster, but this is actually a hard surface. It's not, uh, it's not fleshy or soft. With the exception of flies, if you're looking at flies, their abdomens do tend to be kind of fleshy, kind of like the larva and that kind of stuff. Um, so more inspiration there um, that we'll be drawing on and then I want to find of course one of my favorite bugs the leaf cutter ant with some really wild detail and this is actually a really old model of mine I did this a long time ago one of my favorites but just so you know I'm not making this up we could take a look at a reference here this is a leaf cutter ac acromermex you can see the kind of detailing we get on this and uh, another one. So 
Um, if you look at something like a Mantis, you're going to see a smoother kind of quality to it. The detail is a lot finer, but you can see these areas of tension here on uh, the different parts of the face and then along these edges here. Here's a Katie did in full color. Of course, it's not really high resolution, so you can kind of see. You see how each bug has its own personality in terms of the detailing, the noise and stuff. Uh, here's a great example of tiger beetle of kind of these long sort of streaky lines that almost form like a fingerprint pattern. And I do have, uh, I have done a tiger beetle before. They're, they're really fun. Um, and then, of course, you have like a leaf mantis. You know, when they're imitating the camouflage of other... Here's a Katie did. So you can see that kind of stuff going on. Anywho, uh, scorpion... Scorpion tail is great because you can see on these ridges here how it has these little spikities that kind of follow along and really give a sense of composition to the, uh, to the organism itself. And I've done like a few scorpions before and they're really fun. Another great uh, thing to notice when talking about scorpions is in between each segment of the tail you do see some fleshy bits here that are kind of exposed and when you're texturing that sort of creamy kind of translucence kind of uh you know interspersed between the dark um uh, uh exoskeleton really it just makes it adds the realism it makes it look really really cool so if you're dying to do some fleshy bits when you're doing insects you can look for those spaces in between uh, the parts of the carapace to get the ideas. And then, of course, if you're doing like bees, you're going to get a lot of hair, fuzziness, and that kind of stuff. Here's a leaf hopper, shiny kind of almost Darth Vader-like kind of quality to it with some bumpities and bubbles. So here's a good example of like, you can see the reflection of the hairs on here, which creates kind of an interesting image, but then you also get these kind of like bubble details and a very, very shiny, smooth, you know, uh, bright specular uh, highlight. Um, these things are just so wild. I don't know where they, uh, where they come from. Oh, this, by the way, Andreas K. He is a, or he was, he's uh, passed away, unfortunately. Very famous photographer, one of my favorites. Uh, I used to follow him all the time. And uh, just wonderful videos and uh, photography. So get a chance to look him up because he's got all of these images come from him. Here's a great grasshopper. Look at the detail on that thing. Right. Sorry, I, I'm going off on this stuff because I can't help it. Um, I do want to point out another one of my favorite photographers. Uh, and that's where I get a lot of my inspiration. Give me a second here to minimize this and take a look at uh, chats. And so um, there's a really great book by one of my favorite photographers and scientists, Peter Nisgrecki. The name of the book is Smaller Majority. He also has a website and blog called The Smaller Majority. Uh, he's a Harvard scientist. Uh, I've gone on a few um, bug shot workshops with him, including to Mozambique. Uh, he spends a lot of time in Mozambique at Gorongosa Park taking pictures. He takes pictures of all kinds of animals, but he does specialize in katydids and bats. So you might want to follow him on Instagram um, and, or check out some of his books. Um, and his name, let me see if I can get the spelling of it, is Peter Nisgrecki, right here. Just a really wonderful person and amazing photographer and somebody worth uh, following and reading some of his books. His books are some of my favorite references. So check him out, smallermajority.com. Worth a visit, little plug for him. And then one more plug before we get started. Um, I do have a series on the Noman Workshop. I have several series on the Noman Workshops involving insects and spiders. This is one of my more recent ones, Creature Modeling with ZBrush and Marmoset Tool Bag. Uh, I do an or uh, Orchid Mantis, and I do it all the way from beginning, Z-Spheres, all the way to final render in Marmoset, poly painting, texturing, the whole bit. Um, so check that out on the Noman Workshop. Um, and then I have another one, which is all about jumping spiders and working with uh, Yeti for hair. So again, uh, plenty of content there, all the way from beginning in ZBrush to final render in Redshift for Maya with uh, Yeti. And then I do, this is a slightly older one. Uh, this is another wasp. This is um, 
hyper realistic insect design where I also kind of make up a bug as I go along, kind of like what I'm doing on this uh, live series. And uh, this one I think is rendered in Octane. I've, I've kind of moved over to Redshift recently. I just really like Redshift. It's easy to use. And of course now it's part of ZBrush. But this one was done in Octane for users of Octane. And again, goes all the way from Z spheres to final render in Maya. So check that out if you get a chance in the Nomen Workshop. And now it's time to start having some fun. And so as I often do, I'm going to start with the head. So maybe go in here to, well, actually, let's talk a little bit about some techniques for creating noise brushes, which is always a lot of fun. So uh, I'm going to shift over to a good old fashioned sphere here um, and just talk about some cool techniques. Now, I, you guys are probably aware of surface noise. Let's subdivide this a few times. So I'll go over some noise techniques here. So I'm going to get this up to, uh, let's do like six million polygons just so we have plenty to work with here and um take a quick sip of beer and uh, i'll talk first about designing some noise and this is just a very brief overview because you can really get into this topic um i know uh okay so let's go into the tool palette and we're going to go down here we're going to go down here to surface if I just turn on noise, we get this window, which you guys are probably familiar with. And it creates an overall noise to the entire surface of the model. So we're seeing a preview of it here in this window. We don't see anything in here yet. But we can go in here and start to make adjustments with this graph by dragging on these dots. So remember, if I, if I have a dot here and I drag it all the way off, I can remove the dot. Or I can click on here to add dots and I could just start messing with it like this. I can also create straight lines here by clicking off and dragging back on here again. And what this graph is doing is it's kind of changing the way that the noise is projected on the surface. If I go up here to the noise scale and increase the scale, now we can see a little bit better of what's going on as I adjust these, um, these dots on this graph, right? Now, if I just say, okay, what we get is we get a surface noise, but this is technically a bump map. In other words, it's not actually applied to the surface. If I get something like the inflate brush and I start drawing on this, right? You can see the noise is consistent across the entire surface, even when I get um, these like weird intersections. And that is because the noise is being projected as a bump map. It's not actually on the surface. If I turn noise off, we go back to our smooth uh, geometry, right? Now, if I go to the surface uh, sub palette here without actually going into this, if I, if I do want to change this noise, I could just hit edit and then go in here and make changes, you know, change the strength, how it's applied, whether it's using a mask and so on, even change the angle and, and just mess with all this kind of stuff and say, okay. But if I go into the surface and I say apply to mesh, now it's baked into the surface. So this now is actually part of the geometry, right? So um, if I turn noise on again and edit, then I'm going to be editing noise on top of that noise, right? So the couple layers of noise and I can choose apply to mesh and you get nice noisy surface, right? I'm gonna go back a step here and another step back to this. So this is before I apply to the mesh. So we're back to the bump map. The other thing we could do is I can choose mask by noise and now it's gonna create a mask based on that noise let's go back to a smooth sphere here there we go i do mask by noise now we just have a mask and i'll use this as well you can invert the mask and so on let's invert the mask and then if i go in here and like do a reverse inflate or an inflate right there you can see now the noise is kind of localized and i can smooth it as i work with the mask still applied and this is how i get some of the details that i put on my surface right and then if I clear the mask, we have no more mask and I can smooth it further. Shift down a couple subdivision levels, do some smoothing and do some blending. Redivide and you get this. So you get a nice variation there, right? 
So this is uh, the basics of working with surface noise. Now, of course, the other thing you can do is there's a lot going on in that noise plugin palette. So let's go back to a nice smooth sphere. Let's see here, clear the mask and go back into the surface noise. So choose noise, edit. And this time, instead of uh, the regular noise, I'm going to go into the noise plugin. But first, let's do this. I'm going to reset that graph and I'm going to choose noise plug. And now we get this, which is a whole bunch of different other types of noise. And if you've seen this in my previous live streams, I used the hex tile to create this, the, uh, the look of the eyes, the hexagon pattern on the eyes of the Omatidia. But you have all these other different um, procedural noises, and they've also added in 2024 Maxon noise. Maxon in C Cinema 4D uh, has a really nice uh, tool set or suite of procedural noises, and now they've introduced this or integrated it into ZBrush. So if I click on noise, then I can go down here and I have a drop down uh, menu of all these other different noises. So if I do like wavy turbulence, for example, and then I choose OK, and then we can go in here. I'm going to set the mix basic noise to zero so that the only thing I'm looking at is the noise plugin. And now I'm going to play with the scale and see if we can get it to actually show up. Okay, there we go. So I had to mess with the strength a little bit for it to show up, but now I can go in here and change the, pl change the plugin scale and get this type of swirly goo, which is really nice. And again, I can also use this graph to edit it. And again, I could apply it to the surface or just create a mask or whatever. So you're getting a really kind of cool look here, right? And then maybe I'll choose OK and uh, apply to mesh. And now I have this, which is very cool, right? So that, again, is all found in noise plug. And I've noticed with this, the noise plug, it's like when you click on edit, you get yet another pop-up menu. And you'll definitely have to mess with the scale and the strength a little bit when using these before you start to see something show up. So if you don't see anything, it doesn't mean it's not working. It just means that you might have to adjust the scale relative to the object or the strength, etc. Right? So that's the max on noise. And now what I want to show you very quickly is the noise brush. So what we've been working with now is in the tool palette, surface noise, right? But if I go into the brush palette, there's also a noise brush. So let's bring down the brush menu to see what's going on here. So I'm going to dock the brush menu and just sculpt on my surface. Now I get this noisy um, surface uh, or noisy brush stroke, right? But you'll notice this is actually being applied to the surface. It's not a bump map. It's actually deforming this, the uh, geometry of the surface. And we're getting this kind of thing, which is cool. This is a very insect noise. I notice a lot of times when I apply these things and then I do some smoothing, that's when you get this, the, get the, the smoothing creates that really insectoid-like kind of quality to it. But I want to show you the controls very quickly to this. If I go into the brush palette, so now I'm in the brush palette as opposed to the tool palette. This is the tool palette. This is the brush palette. In the brush palette, I also have surface, and this looks a lot like this menu right here. If I choose edit, guess what? I get a very similar pop-up pop up that I did over here in the surface noise with also similar kind of graph. It's got this red line here that allows you to determine the this is the surface of the model, so this would be going in. If I pull out, everything's going out. I could change the scale. I can change the strength and so on. And I can go into noise plug and guess what? I've got the same options here. So maybe I'll go to max on noise and this time I'll choose instead of, uh, I can't remember what I chose last time. I'll choose one of these other wacky ones. Uh, how about uh, sparse convoluted? Or, oh, that one's kind of interesting. And I'll choose OK. And then I can go in here and change the strength. That's maybe too strong. And maybe uh, change this. Let's say I like that. I choose OK. Now when I brush on the surface, 
Let's make sure that I get a nice Z intensity here. And bring down the draw size. Alrighty, way to make me look dumb. Um, I'm going here to edit it and let's bring up the strength again. Let's actually choose a different one. Uh, let's choose. Let's go back to that wavy turbulence. Kind of like that one. Wavy turbulence. And bring the scale down to one here. And bring in the scale. And maybe bring down the strength a little bit. And maybe bring this above the surface. There we go. And let's go bring the plug-in scale down to like that. And let's give this a try. Okay, that's a lot better. So you can see now I'm drawing on the surface and I'm getting the noise just where I sculpt. The other cool thing about this is the local projection mode. Right now, it's the scale of the noise is always the same, no matter how big my or small my draw size is, right? Make a really large draw size. You know, I'm getting more intense, but it's still the same scale. If I do local projection mode, then what I can do is I can change the scale of the noise based on the draw size. All right, so this is a great way to kind of get variation as you're working uh, on your model. Again, you can get that kind of like, you know, noise within noise. So very cool stuff there. Um, so that's a, a lot of options you can use for doing noise in the surface to get cool insect uh, like designs on the on the exoskeleton. Uh, the base startup material is called um, Ma Dirty Blue. It's M A H Dirty Blue, and you can find it on uh, ZBrush. The Pixelogic website in their uh, downloads, they have a um, material library. You might have to hunt around for it a bit on the internet because the Maxon website has moved a lot of this stuff around. Uh, but I talk about it in some of the previous live streams um, on YouTube. We get into uh, the materials where you can download it. It's just basically kind of like a variation of a, of a wax material without the subsurface. But it's called Ma Dirty Blue. You could also probably just go in here and, you know do a Google search for Ma Dirty Blue and yeah do a Google search for Ma Dirty Blue and then click, all right, click on this right here under matte caps go down here to matte and it is da, 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 right here it's either two versions of it right here click on this and then you can download it install it into ZBrush and you are good to go. But it's a great material. It's the one that I like because it really brings out the details well and it doesn't wear out the eyes too much. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, the next thing I want to talk about in terms of surface detail is uh, one of, of the uh, extractor brushes because I use this quite a bit as well. So maybe what I'll do is let's go back to a smooth sphere and I'm going to go back to this noise and choose edit and that noise plugin and let's do that maxon noise and let's do that um i don't know cell veronoi and let's get rid of mixed basic noise and set that to zero bring in the strength on this and then plug in scale i don't like that one let's do a different one let's do Wavy turbulence. I like that one. Get the strength going. Play with this a little bit. Something like this. Okay. Let's say I do that, and then I'm going to do apply to mesh. So I just wanted to get some kind of noise on there. So you could do this with any kind of detail. It could be sculpted detail. In fact, let's do that. I'm going to go in here and. Um, Get the Damien standard brush and I'm going to set this to spray and set the placement really high and maybe something like this for the alpha. Okay. And bring down the draw size. Mm, maybe not that much. Bring down the Z intensity. So get something like this. So just something kind of 
a mixture of that surface noise plus the um, plus some sculpted noise. And so this is sometimes how I design noise for bugs. I'll go in here and create something. I'll look at my reference and then go on like a sphere like this one and say, okay, um, let's see if I can imitate what I see in my reference. In this case, I'm just doing kind of random stuff. And um, maybe I'll just do a little smoothing here. And just a little bit more, just to really make it crazy. Okay, something like that, right? Now I'm gonna go into the brush palette and I'm going to press X. So I could just see these brushes right here, the extractor brushes. And I'm gonna use this one right here, the extractor. This allows you to grab detail as well as poly paint from a model and you turn it into a brush, right? So it's another way to create a custom brush. First thing you wanna do before do anything else though is I'm gonna store an undo history state. So I'm gonna go up here to the undo history bar hold control and click on this to store that state. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring my draw size up a little bit and I'm going to press the G hotkey. So I'm gonna press G and you'll see that my brush turns light blue, right? So that means it's in capture mode. And now I'm just gonna drag a line down here across the surface and give it a few seconds and you can see it's created this custom alpha and now if I go to, let's say, I'll go to um, another model. Let's just do W and I'll do uh, a polyplane. And it's, uh, let's subdivide this a few times just to get enough polygons. Let's get it up to, let's say, 4 million, right? And now my extractor brush, I'm gonna go back to draw mode. So I have my extractor brush, you can see the alpha here. Now if I draw on this, guess what? I get this repeating pattern that I just captured. And maybe if I lower the draw size, then it lowers it as well, I increase the draw size. So this is a great way to quickly create custom brushes, right? And you can sample you know, anything in ZBrush and it can also have poly paint as well, it'll create te texture. And so what you could do is say, you know, brush, save as, and then you save it as a ZBP file. That's a ZBrush brush preset. If I save it in, let's see, if I go into uh, my C drive and program files, and oops, I was going to the wrong one. Sorry, just regular program files. Thank you. Go down here to Maxon. Let's see, Maxon ZBrush 2024. Uh, I'm still using the beta. Um, if I go into Z startup, brush presets, and I'll call this um, uh, googly or something like that. Then um, when I start up ZBrush, it'll always be in here uh, as one of the brush presets. If I save it into that folder. So you can create a whole series of brush uh, brushes for the d different insects that you uh, create if you get some kind of design on your surface that you really like and you want to use that for a different model create an extractor brush the other extractor brushes are similar they just have a different stroke style so we have extractor dot and extractor drag rep so if i go to extractor dot and this time i'll store this hit undo history state and i'll choose g it's going to allow me to drag it but it's going to be drag dot as opposed to a brush stroke so it's going to be slightly different. And then the other one is going to be the, um, let's see, drag rect. So if I, again, I still store that history state, so that's fine. Press the G hotkey and then sample this. Now I get this kind of thing. I can drag out like this. So it's really just different stroke styles. So, but it's a really useful technique. So. Let's go back to our bugs and with the, yes, the brush, when you save the brush, it will save that custom alpha as well. So you can load it up anytime you want. Um, so a great example, let's do it here on uh, my Acromermex, if she does not mind, just to sort of bring this, to highlight this. And so the head here is 5 million. So I'm going to store this undo history state Let's go back to our extractor brush. I called it googly. 
Uh, I'm going to increase the draw size. Press G and sample this. So you're going to see we have a different alpha now. I'll go back to my plane. And there you go. See that same kind of uh, uh, surface quality that I got from um, that ant is now on here. And if I save that, it will be available next time I load that brush in the ZBrush with the alpha. And also, if you have something that has like poly paint on it, um, like I've done this before for wood textures where I've created a wood texture brush just from, you know, uh, get it, you know actually a really good techniques is if you use uh, mega scans, right? So a great example is um, I wanted to create a bone brush because believe it or not, I was sculpting something other than a bug. And so I wanted to create a, a bunch of different brushes that captured the texture of bone. So what I did is I load up some of the Megascan's uh, bone models here in ZBrush, convert the texture to poly paint, right? Make sure it's really high resolution so that detail is there. And then I use the extractor brushes to uh, sample not only the details on the bone, the scanned bone, but also the textures that come with that bone, and then I got a bunch of bone brushes. So that's a really great way to uh, build a library from, um, from like say, mega scans or other, other models you may have downloaded. All right, it's time for a sip of beer. And then we're gonna get into some bug sculpting. Stay in school, kids. Um, okay. I don't need to save the project. Let's go into, da 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 or wasp and maybe what I'll do is I'm going to start by sculpting on this mandible here and I'll hit the solo button so this is already let me see uh, highest um, I've got five subdivisions level so this is the lowest subdivision level so that's uh, 520 points and let's divide it get it up to 2 million is probably a good place to start Let's take a, take a look at some reference, you know, just to get some inspiration. Now, I, I pulled, I got this, um, or I was inspired to do this design from a, an existing mud dauber wasp. So you can see here's a lovely picture of it from the internet. So you can see it's got some hairs on it. Notice that the hairs do line up with these little pits right here. So, um, and you can use that. You can use, sculpt the pits in here, and I'll show you how you can use fiber mesh and masking to place hairs into each one of those pits. It's not super exact, but it's it's good enough usually and easy enough to edit. So I kind of want to, you know, I'm, I'm looking at this, I got some sort of scoring right here, some lateral kind of scratches. I've got kind of this kind of interesting, you know, along the edges here, some thickness here, some wearing and tearing, but I also have some pitting and then some larger lines and then the areas where the hair comes out. So those are all things that I'm kind of looking at. And you can see I kind of started to do that when I was doing the model earlier. In the, in uh, I think I sculpted this in the second, first or second in this series, uh, if you want to go back and watch the older live streams. All right, let's let it auto save. Dun, dun, dun. And let's let it crash, why not? We'll wait for it to respond. And in the meantime, We'll have a sip of beer. I've got a lot of models in here, so the autosave is going to be a large project. All right, worst case scenario, we're going to have to reload it. How's everybody doing tonight? There we go. Um, okay, so let's start sculpting. And so usually, you know, I kind of like I have here, I usually start with the larger details, like I was implying some teeth down here. So I'm gonna get out one of my favorites brushes, which is the um, SK Cloth. SK stands for Sakuri. I can never pronounce his name, and I apologize. And once again, because I want to give him a shout out. Um, He's actually a live streamer here on Pixelogic. Sakaki Karo. 
I'm sorry, I'm mangling the pronunciation of your, pronunciation of your name. He's got some great brushes. I highly recommend it. You can download it, send him some money. Um, they're my favorite brushes. So highly recommend it. Also check out his live stream because he does amazing stuff. He's more, he's more character based. Um, but I like this brush because it just, it just creates these very lovely, elegant lines. Um, I used to use Damien standard brush for a lot of this kind of stuff, but I kind of switched to, uh, this, this type of brush or this particular brush. And so I'm just kind of creating some of those larger scoring details to start with. Maybe kind of, and I like to keep it nice and loose and organic, right? So I'm gonna kind of go in here and, so I'm drawing and also smoothing. So I'm gonna go into the brush palette. I'm gonna hold the shift key and go down to the smooth brush modifiers and set my alt brush size to a larger size. That means that when I hold the shift key, my smooth brush is larger than the draw size of my regular drawing. And I like that because it kind of just smooths out the area a little bit more. Um, so I'm kind of alternating drawing and then holding the alt key to kind of click in and, and overlapping those strokes just a little bit to create kind of a nice organicness. I'm going to bring out some of these details a bit more. sharper so these are actually kind of the teeth so maybe I'll switch over to a move brush here and just drag these out just a little bit make them a bit more menacing oops I know that I, um, a long time ago, I sculpted and animated a Fire Ant, Solenopsis Invicta, which is a really cool. That's the one, that's the red fire ant that terrorizes the southern United States. It actually came, was imported by accident from uh, South America. Um, and has since kind of taken over the south here. But I did a sculpt of it a while back in an animation kind of describing how the venom of that particular ant works. And uh, you can see it on my website, Entomology Animated. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that um, I worked really hard at trying to get an accurate model. and But I got an email at one point from an entomologist who noted that I had the wrong number of teeth on the mandibles. So they're really paying close attention to that. So for particular species, you have to be careful. If you're trying to do an accurate model, make sure you're getting the right number of teeth because that's one of those identifiers that entomologists use to distinguish one species from another. Um, I fixed it, of course, and then actually met him on a bug shot, which is really nice, a really nice guy. One of the, you know, I talked about references a lot in my last live stream. The one thing that I neglected to mention, because I talked about, you know, I use Google image searches, I use books, I use, I go out in the field, I take my own pictures, uh, and I watch videos and all this kind of stuff, to, and I get specimens and I look at them under the microscope. The one reference that I think is really important that I neglected to mention is actual scientists, actual entomologists. They're some of the best sources of information. So if you can go to your local natural history museum, like I know Brian Brown, who is a fly specialist over here in the LA Natural History Museum, as well as Lisa Gonzalez and Emily Hartop and a few others. And so I, they're friends of mine. And because um, I started going to the museum and I met them and asked a bunch of questions and started participating in some of the museum entomology related events. But it's great to be able to just email somebody with a question and and get a good answer or find out whether something is you're completely off or maybe something that nobody actually knows. But it's always interesting. 
and I, you know, I met a lot of scientists that way, and they're one of the most valuable re valuable resources for reference. You guys know that they hire scientists frequently on movies to uh, as consultants, and then they don't listen to them. Um, Somebody once told me that they were a consultant, or they knew a consultant who was hired in The Scorpion King. Remember that movie with starring The Rock? Some of the worst CG in the history of all of the of CG. So it's worth seeing just to see how bad it is. Um, but they were hired as a consultant, and the guy, the uh, director, kept asking questions about the eyes of the scorpions. And this whole shot they wanted to do with the scorpion eyes. And the entomologist is like, scorpion eyes are like little light sensors. They don't really work. They don't use their eyes much at all. And, of course, the director was very disappointed in that answer. I was like, really? Too bad, man. So I'm just kind of creating, now, you know, I'm playing with these ideas and creating happy accidents here. Like I say, this is why it's my favorite part of the whole process. And then what I might do is on top of this, and a little squiggly, nervous noise. Again, I'm just using the SK cloth brush for everything here. Um, Let's take a look at the other side here. You know, when I think about this, I'm thinking about what it's going to look like when it's finally rendered here, when I'm creating the shaders. Now, I, I, like I said, I render with Redshift these days. So I think about when I'm sculpting these details, how the light is going to interact with, with the details on the surface. You know, because these things tend to be nice and shiny. And that's what uh, the specularity is what's going to reveal these forms more than anything else. Getting the uh, inflate brush with the low Z intensity and going in here and just creating a little bit of sub bumps, I guess. So it's a bit more organic. Again, smoothing it out a little bit. It's a nice way to get some quick organic qualities to this, so imperfections. And of course, since I made these mandibles uh, asymmetrical, I'm going to have to kind of remember the way I'm going about creating these details so I can duplicate it on the other mandible. But, you know, some differences to it, so it's interesting. These chompers are probably used for not only, you know, suppressing prey, but also for nest building, right? So it's probably chewing through some, you know, if I'm basing this on a mud dauber, then mud daubers are actually manipulate, well, mud, to create their nests. So it's going to have some wear and tear on it from doing that. Let's smooth that out a little bit. Sometimes I'll go down a couple subdivision levels and just hit it with a smooth brush just to knock it out, knock it down a little bit so it's not so overwhelming because you also want to have some flatter areas to reflect the light and also places where you can put fine detail. And then go back up again. Do this, which looks pretty good. Let's do a little save next. Then I'm going to create, let's play with some of that surface noise a little bit. So I'm going to go in here to surface noise and uh, zoom in on this. Let's hit the frame button. There we go. So I think what I want to do here is I want to create kind of fine level of noise. Something like this. Maybe I'll even bring down the scale a little bit. 
and use the graph to kind of create a little bit more space there. Something like this. Maybe I said the strength in the opposite direction, so it's kind of going in a bit more. Something like this. And I'll choose OK. And I'll choose Apply to Mesh. So just kind of like a, a little bit of a fine detail. Like if I feel like this isn't strong enough, I can go into the stroke palette and with that adjust last slider, maybe bring this up a little bit more. Just be aware when you hit the adjust last, it's gonna turn the noise back on again. I don't know if that's a bug or what, but I'll turn that off. But here's the result. So that looks pretty good. It's just kind of a subtle bit of noise. You can hit, you know, if I hit the smooth brush, it kind of gets a little gone but I think what I want to do now is um, take a look at this and I want to create some of these areas for I can where I can have hairs coming out so little dots yeah the other great movie for incredibly bad CG from that area era of course is Wild Wild West that's a classic and terribleness. They actually do have a tarantula hawk wasp animation in there that's really, really terrible. It's worth, worth checking out. Um, if you like watching bad stuff and cringing, it's the C in CG stands for cringe, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna get my Damien Standard Brush and I'm gonna set this to drag rect and brush alpha there. That's probably pretty good. Let's bring up the Z intensity a little bit. Yeah, let's see what you want. Is two million. Yeah, that's probably good. So we kind of create. Let's undo that. Make sure the surface noise is still on. Okay. And kind of create an uneven row here. I don't want these to be exactly the same size. I want a little bit of variation and also not in a perfectly straight line. Smaller down here, a little bit closer together. One of my new favorite features of 2024, even though I'm not using it right now, is this stroke tripe drag stamp. Because if you do need the, the strokes to be exactly the same size, you can use that. And, then, and dragging just changes the intensity, not necessarily the size. But in this case, I'm using drag wrecked because I want the size to be a little bit different for each one of these uh, pits. I'll do some up here. And something like that is kind of cool. A few more. Uh, 
this kind of like this kind of pattern uh, is another thing that kind of adds a lot of visual interest to the design because the eye seeks out or I should say the brain seeks out patterns you know so the patterns are not exact it's even more satisfying it's like providing the brain with a little bit of a puzzle but the other thing is from the insect design point of view I'm going to use each one of these as a placement for a hair as close as possible so they have kind of rows of hairs coming out like I see in a lot of these guys and maybe even on the inside All right, something like that. Let's give that a try. So now, let's um, save this real quick. And do a quick experiment using some fiber mesh and some masking. So first, let's create a mask. And I'm going to create a mask for just those little points there. A um, few ways we can do this. We could try, first of all, going into mask by cavity. That's a little bit, that's kind of overall and it includes some of the noise that I created earlier. We could go in here to the cavity profile and play with this a little bit. That's making things a little bit more masked. It's a little bit less. That might not work. Um, we can go over here, mask by smoothness. Let's see how that goes. That's pretty close right there. So that's giving us masking. And it'd be nice if it was a little bit tighter. So let's see if I bring up the range here. It's probably going to expand it. Yeah, it's less tight. So let's bring down the range. That's not bad at all. Let's see. Is that actually masked? Yeah. So let's set the range to like five. And reduce the fall off. Maybe increase it all off. We really want to see what's being masked. You can switch to this flat color. It's a little bit too much, so now let's try mask by curvature. Hmm. And mask by peaks and valleys. There we go. So we got that. Maybe I'll just hold the uh, control key, control and alt, and just, you know, clear out some of the smaller bits right here. But it's not too bad. A little bit of randomness is okay. I don't think I want them right here, though. The other thing I could have done is actually turn on RGB for my uh, Damien Standard Brush when I made these little dots and then um, poly paint it at the same time and then convert the poly paint into mask. That's another option. Let's say something like this. I'm going to leave it a little bit sloppy intentionally and let's go down here to masking and boost that mask a little bit just to make it a little bit of action let's do this let's shrink mask and then boost mask eh, something like that sharpen mask Okay, something like that. And then uh, go back to my blue material and let's play with some fiber mesh. So I'll go in here to fiber mesh and let's choose preview. So that's a little bit too silly. Let's go to white material so it's easier to see. And I'm also going to set my base color to white and my tip color to white just so it's easier to see. Okay, so we got a bit too much there. 
So um, now it's time to play with some fiber mesh settings. Basically, I just want like one or two hairs coming out of each one of those little dots, right? So we can lower the coverage. And well, actually, let's bring in the coverage and let's do by mask and then lower by area. Bring down the max fibers. There we go. It's a little bit more reasonable. A little bit long, so let's bring down the length. Again with the project save, so let's take a sip of beer. Check out the uh, chat here real quick. How do you get your panning camera to move around this model? Oh, it might be because uh, the question is great stuff. How do you get your panning camera to move around the model so smoothly? The answer is I'm using dun, 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 a space mouse. So space mouse is allowing me to kind of, as I work, I can Take a look nice and slow and rotate. It also saves a lot on my uh, my left hand. So uh, check out Space Mouse. Great company, good product. Thank you for allowing me to make an endorsement. Um, let's go here to the gravity and set the gravity to zero so that these are a little bit straighter. Let's bring up the coverage a bit so they're a little bit thicker. Um, let's see, now it's a matter of just kind of like getting the variation down and the clumping down and let's see I don't want any twist on here I want these as straight as possible probably require some grooming Usually when I do hair for the final model, I will do um, in my either paint effects or like Yeti or something like that. But fiber mesh is pretty cool too. Fiber mesh is great when you're kind of concepting and just kind of figuring things out. Uh, with all things ZBrush, twiddling with settings is the key. And let's make the length a little bit shorter. Okay, I mean that looks pretty good. We don't need to be super hairy. Anything else I want to do in here? I think it's okay. So I'm going to go and choose accept. It's going to make another sub tool. Of course, I have the solo button on, so let's turn solo off. And let's choose that fibers and let's rename it. We'll just call this uh, mandible fiber one. And take like a grooming brush. Just use it to kind of straighten them out a little bit so they're not too willy-nilly. We do not want willy or nilly or willy vanilly, vanilly, vanilla, nilly, vanilla, vanilla, ice. My brain stopped. Some kind of fun experimentation. I think another way to go, like I said, is I could probably have a more precise mask if I'd use like RGB 
on my Damien Standard brush. I'm going to smooth these just to make them a little bit shorter. But this works pretty well. But hair is always important for insect design, even just a little bit. Wasps tend to be a lot less hairy than bees, but just a little bit of hair can really sell the design and make it look very exciting and a bit more menacing. If you compare this mandible to this one, you can kind of see what I mean. It looks kind of cool. Um, yeah, that looks pretty neat. Straighten that one out. A uh, quick tip, let's say you want to straighten these things out, but you don't necessarily want them to shrink, right? If I hit these guys with a smooth brush, you see how they shrink? It's straightening them out, but it's also making them smaller. But I don't like that. So I can go into the brush palette, and under fibers, fiber mesh, I'm going to hold the shift key, which means I'm editing the smooth brush. And I'm going to set preserve length all the way to 100. And now when I hit it with a smooth brush, it will smooth those fibers out, but it won't make them shrink. So that can be a nice way to, uh, to straighten them out a little bit without, without losing any of the length. That's available, that setting is available for any brush. Sometimes another way, great way to deal with fiber mesh is rather than using a groom brush, just use their regular move brush. That works as well. You can even, let's see, if I had the move brush activated under fiber mesh, if I set preserve length to 100, now I can move them around, but again, I'm not changing their length at all. The length is always the same. I mean, a lot of the groom brushes really are just regular ZBrush brushes with some of these settings applied. They're not that fancy. So I just created kind of my own groove move brush, groove move brush, smooth brush, All right? So that looks pretty cool. Let's save that sucker. Okay, so we got a little bit of uh, fiber mesh going on there. I want to bring out some of the details on this mandible. So I'm going to alt click on that mandible again. Let's rename it because it's still called Skin Z Sphere. And I'll just call it Mandible. And I'm going to go in here and just let's clear the mask. Control drag to release and clear the mask. I'm going to hit the solo button. And uh, I'm going to go in here and first of all, I'm going to store a morph target. Store a morph target just so I can always go back to some of these details because I do like them. And then I'm going to go in here to geometry and let's hit it with the clay polish brush. I'm going to go clay polish. It's going to lose some of the detail, but you notice it leaves behind that mask. If I switch to flat color, you can see there's a little bit of a mask left behind from hitting that clay polish brush. I'm going to invert that mask. Um, let's go back to that blue material, control H, just to hide the mask. So the mask is still applied. I've just hidden it with control H. And I'll use maybe like inflate and then come in here. Whoops. And let's move. Let's go inflate. And just go with the inflate brush, maybe a negative inflate brush, just to bring some of this detail out and I'm going to negative inflate with that mask applied and hold the shift key and now we're getting something that looks really even more bug like in my opinion and this is one of those techniques that kind of discovered by mistake a long time ago when I, when I hit the clay polish and I started sculpting on the surface and I noticed that weird things were happening and then I realized it's because that clay polish button button leaves a mask sort of lingering on the surface but it's a very it's it's like it's similar to some of these other masks like uh, mask by smoothness or peaks and valleys it's a very 
it's like on the edges and you can get, go in here with the inflate and also with the smooth brush kind of bring that stuff out to get some cool cool looking details here it's kind of stuff that you see like in the electro the electron microscope images do a negative inflate there so I'm just holding the all key so you get that that looks a lot like the cracks that I see on on uh, some insects surfaces all that subtle super realistic detail that I live for and sometimes it could just it just makes that surface noise even that much more interesting As a technique, so go up here. You can see how it's it's bringing out some of that surface noise even more, but in a much more organic way. And it's adding a lot of kind of stress in there as well, which is cool. I admit that I use this technique quite a bit, so maybe too much, but I love it. You know. You know, so all the, all these living, I mean, it looks a little bit like leather there, so maybe that's too much. But I think if we have a shiny shader applied to it, it won't look, it won't look quite so much like leather. It'll look more like, well, cracks in an exoskeleton. And the reason I like brushing this kind of stuff is because it's varying the intensity and, this, and, and that kind of thing. So it's not so uniform. Because what you want to avoid is you want to avoid too much uniform um, noise on your model. Because then it'll look artificial. It'll look CG. Look like something out of the Scorpion King, right? You can also go in here and say the Demon Standard Brush. Whoops, that's not the Damien Standard Brush. This is. Let's set this back. Let's just go brush. Uh, reset brush. Reset current brush. And just draw some lines on here while I still have that mask applied. Eh, okay. I don't know if that's really doing it when I want it to. Not really. Let's try the SK Cloth Brush. That, to me, looks really insectoid. You know, it's like if you get really close like this and say, oh my god, it looks like you can see the individual polygons. Don't forget, you're really close to the model. I'm never going to render it probably any closer to this. So it's an easy trap to get into when you're like looking at microscopic detail and trying to... If your model is subdivided and your subtool is like 150 million points, you're probably do, going overboard. So... Pay attention to how close you think you'll be to the model in the final render. So this looks kind of cool. And again, I could also use the extract extractor brush to extract some of these this kind of detailing and use it on other models. But that's that's kind of what I like. I'm going to control drag and release to clear the mask, and so you can see now there's the mandible. So that's what we got now. And you can compare it to the other mandible, which is where we started. Now, um, I'm actually going to move on to another part of the model rather than I might redo this or add detail to this mandible offline because it's going to be the exact same process that I used for this. So it's just repeating everything I've already done. Uh, maybe there's some value in that. Um, but I did want to point out it's like uh, one of the things. Like I like this surface noise that I used as a is the generator for this kind of thing several steps back. But if I go to this subtool right here, 
And let's subdivide that up to a couple million. And I go to surface and I choose noise. And this is going, it's putting me back to the default noise settings. So each subtool reverts to the default noise settings. Uh, right, default noise settings. So, but I want to have the same noise that I had on this subtool on this one. But luckily, you know, see, there's a copy and paste option. So what I can do, and is I can go back to this subtool, right, where I generated that noise. I'll turn on noise, go into edit. You can see that that's the noise that I designed. This is the custom noise. I can save this as a noise file and load that in few, for future projects if I really like it. Or I can also choose copy to copy these settings. I'm gonna choose cancel, turn off the noise there, go into this subtool, choose noise, paste, and it will paste those settings. And now I can choose okay and apply to mesh. So you can copy and paste noise from one subtool to the next if you want if you want to be consistent across the whole model. The other thing is you can also um, when you save the tool, it's going to save the noise settings with the tool. So any noise that I apply, if I close ZBrush, come back later, open up that tool, turn on noise, those same settings will be there. So that's that's another nice feature. Uh, can you layer the noises? You can layer the noises. You could apply different surface noises in if you're using 3D layers You would basically turn on the noise and then apply the noise while that layer is in record mode Then go to another layer Same thing do a different noise apply to mesh while the while the layer is in record mode and then you could you know shift the uh, strength of those layers individually if you wanted to uh, play with the strength and noise. I'm not, I don't usually use 3D layers just because it's not my style, but it is, if you're into 3D layers, you can definitely layer the noises. And then of course you can also keep applying the same noise or apply different noise settings to the same subtool and, you know, go that way. Um, so that's, that's another option that you have. Um, but it's definitely one of my favorite out, uh, aspects of ZBrush. So let's go up here to the head here and uh, let's take a look at this. So this is 1.3 million. So let's go in here under geometry and let's subdivide it. 5 million, that's probably good enough. You don't need to go too crazy. I do have, currently have symmetry on here. Let's turn on solo and I'm gonna go in here with the SK cloth and just Actually, I might turn off symmetry at this point because I've already got kind of the basic um, details sculpted and I don't want to make this too symmetrical. I want it to be asymmetrical. So it'll look much more natural. A lot of times when I'm working with symmetry, depending on the model, like if I'm working on say the thorax on one side, that'll definitely turn on symmetry because it's almost impossible to look at both sides at exactly the same time. So might as well use symmetry to save time on that, you know, and then you could break up the symmetry a little bit later. Um, or what I'll do is I'll have symmetry on for all, most of the sculpting process. And then towards a later stage, when I do fine detailing, I'll turn symmetry off and do another layer of detail. Just so I take advantage, you know, the, because symmetry of course is a huge time saver. Uh, so I like I like that aspect of it, but too much symmetry is going to look artificial. Um, so I'm going to do this kind of thing. Bring out some of these details. Just kind of creating that kind of look of tension here by creating these lines, a little bit of damage. Yeah, 
and I also like to work fast when I'm doing this kind of thing. So I get that kind of like loose kind of quality to it. So I'm not like fretting over a single, every single stroke. Some of the techniques I used are designed to make it look like I spent more time on it than I actually did. Not that I'm spending a lot of time caring about it, but it's like, I like to work fast. Especially because, you know, I mean, fast is relative. I'm drawing these lines fast, but remember, I'm just doing the head now, and I've already spent almost an hour on one mandible. Um, and I still have, you know, the head, the thorax, the abdomen, the legs. Uh, legs can get kind of tedious, um, but just put on some cool music and then you're fine. Let's turn on transparency here. You know, I like to, oops. You know, I'll draw a big thick line and then hold the Alt key and draw a line on top of that to kind of split it. That kind of looks very natural to me. Sorry, we're doing an autosave now. I'd hold the escape key, escape key to stop this, but you know it's just going to crash ZBrush, so I'll just let it go and check out the chat here real quick. Excuse me for a moment. Yeah, I like that kind of looking of the, of, of the split there in the, uh, in the line. Okay, so what I have here is this is part of the head is coming through the mandible. So I'm going to Alt-click on this, and let's go down to a lower subdivision level, get the move brush, and just pull this out a little bit. This one and there we go. Okay, go back to escape cloth and go up here to this bit. So, like, to bring out some of these details I've done before. Maybe do a little bit of a line just along the edge of. The eye. It's a really cool book called Evolution's Witness. It's a big book. It kind of looks like a coffee table book, but it's worth checking out. It basically traces the evolution of life on Earth. Hopefully, that's not too controversial a topic, um, but it focuses. I'm sorry, that's a bit of a pun. It focuses on the evolution of the eye because the eye has evolved several times independent throughout the story of life on earth it's a really awesome book highly recommend it um, you learn a lot about how the eyes develop but eyes basically start as a photoreceptive cell in other words a cell that is sensitive to light you know, light is basically electrochemical signal, right? So cells become sensitive to it. 
and um, over the course of evolution they they evolve things like clear coatings which become lenses that allow to focus the light more on nerve cells and then eventually a, a brain that can create a picture from that focused light but in many different ways so the guys have probably watched um, famous mantis shrimp videos on YouTube uh, have incredibly complex eyes that can see much more of the electromagnetic spectrum than, than we can and uh, seeing 360 and it's just an inc incredibly weird and wild and wacky eye for just a little shrimp but I really like that book it's uh, it's a cool one Adjust that antenna, antenna a little bit later on. Creating kind of a look of like. It's almost like creating kind of like stretched muscle, but I don't want it to end up. You put a shiny shader on it, translucent shader, it won't look like muscle. It'll look like dents and stretch marks within the uh, exoskeleton. That is cool. And this is right where the mandible comes in. All right, so it's nice and asymmetrical. Let's go over to this side. It's just kind of creating a, a, a edge here or in the eye so it looks like it's more of a natural transition you can also get noise brushes I believe Pablo has a series of insect noise brushes that are pretty cool I kind of like hand sculpting the, the, uh, the details personally that's just my style but can also check out and in other places like art station has them I might release my own series of brushes eventually when I get around to it if people are interested in that kind of thing I like brush design it's one of the more I think the the amount of control you have over the brushes and ZBrush is what sets it apart from all other digital sculpting applications because it's impressive. I mean, all the stuff in the brush palette combined with the alphas and the stroke style and other aspects it just means that there's so many different things you can do with the ZBrush brush. It's almost unlimited. Pretty much any, anything you can think up, there's a way to do it with a brush and ZBrush. Hey, cool, Tattoon. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed making that one. Um, I love jumping spiders. I made an animation many years ago of a peacock jumping spider. It came out okay. I think I might have to revisit it at some point. But I rendered it a mental ray. If it gives you an idea how long ago I made that. Remember mental ray? No. I 
I remember actually working professionally at a studio, I think it was you and company, where we were rendering with Maya software for production. Maya software for production. That is old school and really not fun. Designing cool shaders in Maya software, yuck. Of course, I also I need to say this in old timey voice. Uh, I also remember um, modeling characters with nerves and creatures with nerves. That's no fun. I think everybody should try to model a human ear using nerves surfaces, just for the experience, the sheer hell of it. Let's see if you can get something good looking. One of the first professional animations I did was a beating heart, human heart using nerve surfaces. Oh my god. Animating the heart muscles moving and the valves opening and closing using cluster deformers and lattices. Ugh. And then rendering with Maya software on a silicon graphics machine. That's old school, baby. Don't have any stable diffusion back then, I tell you what. And it's almost like we had to climb into the machine with a flashlight to light the seams, you know. Okay. <laughs> yes, memories. Misty watered colored memories. Working late at night in the studio, just trying to get something that looks almost like snow. Whew. Here's a really cool old Noman workshop video. I don't know if it exists anymore. It was on VHS tape. Alex Alvarez doing creature texturing on NURB surfaces with all projecting the textures onto NURB surfaces, no UVs. Wow, I did that one all the way through and I was watching it on VHS tape too and I almost quit CG, not because it wasn't a great series, it was, but it was just so hard to get it to work. Especially when you had a character made up of nerves patches and you had to keep the patches together as you're animating it. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Looks kind of cool. I'm going to go in here and... I'm gonna spend too much time in the back of the head, just a little bit. Okay, so I'm gonna go into surface. Oh yeah, the sub D modeling. That was like, oh, this is so much better than nerves. Uh, it's only slightly better than nerves. It's going to noise, and I'm going to choose edit, and I'm going to choose paste. Is it actually working? That looks kind of funky. Something weird is happening there. Aha. Uh -huh. It is using... There we go. It was using the noise plugin, which is still the hexagon noise from the eyes. Which just goes to show it does save the settings. Well, that looks kind of cool. Um, okay, so we have that. And then I'm going to choose Apply to Mesh. And let's go into the Stroke Palette. Maybe do Adjust Last. Pump it up a little bit. Turn Noise Off. That's okay. Did it actually do anything? Let's see. Let's go in here and do... Hmm, not really. Um, okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Damien Standard Brush. 
go back to drag rect this alpha and I'm going to start creating and I think this time let's do just for the sake of argument I'm going to go in here and turn on poly paint and I'm going to switch colors so you can see. Okay, so actually, no, I'm going to switch color here. Let's do this. Yeah, switch color. That way, is it working? I'm going to turn on RGB. There we go. This way, each time I make a dot, it's actually going to color it black. And the reason I'm doing that is then, once I'm finished making these dots, I can use that poly paint as a mask so that I can then use the mask to place the um, hairs on the head. Kind of like what I did with the mandibles, but this way I don't have to try using that masking method that I was using before, which was a little bit in imprecise. That still kind of worked, but maybe it'll be less work here. Let's take a look at the head here. We kind of got hairs along these edges like this. It's not, well, we do have them coming out of these pits too, so. Let's do something like this. Yeah, I think, you know, when ZBrush first came along, it's, it's just you can't overstate how incredibly liberating and revolutionary it was because a lot of software packages back in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, were promising a sculpting-like experience. Like the Maya had its own artisan brushes, and there were others, a mappy, other kind of... 3D applications that were all like, this is just like sculpting in clay, and it never was sculpting in clay, like sculpting in clay, until ZBrush came along, and that actually started to really feel like it. Although ZBrush was still very different back then, because you had to use Projection Master to do fine details, which means you had to temporarily drop your model onto the canvas, go into Projection Master, use the 2.5D brushes as a way to sculpt your detail, and then pick up the model again when you were done. And there was always a chance that something could go kind of funky, like you'd have a little point that would be off into the distance, a thousand miles away from your model, virtually speaking. You had to smooth it down, so that was never fun. But still, it was a lot better than what was on the market at the time. So it was, it was really definitely very revolutionary. Uh, I started using ZBrush, you know, I first encountered it like in the early 2000s. And I think I saw at a Mac World in New York. Remember Macintosh? Remember when Apple used to make computers? Um, I was at a Mac World and the ZBrush booth was way in the back and it was teeny tiny. And I saw, I think it was O'Fair was doing a, a demo of it. And I was like a big Lightwave fanatic back then, because Lightwave was a good modeler. But ZBrush was mostly 2.5D at that time. So I wasn't super interested in it. I had a demo of it, and I played with it for a little bit. But I was like, yeah, but this is 2.5D illustration. I'm into 3D. And then all of a sudden it turned into this amazing 3D program. So, so around about 2004 is when I started using it religiously. And I have a lot of crappy models from those days, but hey, that's how you learn. If you learn everything from just watching demos, then anybody who's ever been to a concert would know how to play a musical instrument. That is not exactly the case. You gotta go through the practice, the hell of the practice to get there.
unless you have an AI and then of course it's instantaneous and any knucklehead can make an awesome image, right? You can tell it's later on in the live stream because that's when I start talking weird crap. So I'm just making these dots here and kind of in lines to create kind of an interesting pattern goes along the edges but not strict lines so that there is some kind of randomization Definitely the antenna will have more hair on it because hairs on insect act as, you know, on our skin, of course, we have the luxury of nerves just beneath the skin that allows us to literally feel things like pressure and other things in the environment. Of course, we also have hairs too, right? And obviously the hairs in my arm are really keeping me that warm. So they're there for sensitivity obviously with insects hairs can act kind of like a trigger they have like a trigger mechanism underneath so as the hair moves or pressure is applied to it it bumps into a cell just beneath the exoskeleton so even though it can't really feel through the exoskeleton the same way we do it can use the hairs to feel pressure and that kind of stuff but the other thing is that the hairs can also act as chemoreceptors. So if there are pheromones or other chemical compounds in the air, the hairs will pick them up, just like we have hairs in our nose that will trap chemical compounds and bring them closer to the nerve cells so that we can actually uh, sense what the chemicals are and smell things, right? So that's why hairs are so important on your insect designs and they also just make it look real and you throw on depth of field and nice lighting and it really starts to sing it makes the renders look that much better anybody who spent time studying Cell biology knows that, you know, cells have protrusion, not all cells, but some cells have protrusions called cilia that are basically hairs, right? So it's something that comes from the cells themselves. I'm not an expert in cell biology, but I do find it a really cool topic. It's one of my favorite things to... I've had the luxury of being able to animate a lot of cell biology when I was working at Howard Hughes Medical uh, Institute. Also, when I was working at Digizym, which I do frequently. In fact, I did a project for Digizym just last year. Kind of a cool documentary on bacteria and the microbiome. And then I got to do some cellular animations for the Griffith Observatory Signs of Life planetarium show. So we actually get to fly through a cell in that show, and that was a lot of fun. And I got to model and animate a tardigrade, as well as some other little water critters. So that's really cool. If you're in L.A., go watch Signs of Life at Griffith Observatory. It's a fun show. All CG, 30 minutes, projected on a dome with a live narration. Uh, we got to animate, what was it, 60 frames per second, 8K renders. It 
it was a hell of a render, I'll tell you what. So we had a dedicated render farm in the little studio that we used. I think that looks pretty cool. I'm going to... Make sure I have some more right here. And what I can do is, since I already you know spent some time coming up with the fiber mesh preview settings for the mandible, I can just copy those settings to this one. To this subtool, which should save a lot of time in fiddling around. I'm going to speed this up a little bit because we've got about 15 minutes left here. Yes, uh, yeah, good point. They're also uh, sensitive to electromagnetic fields at that scale, definitely. Excellent point. I got into a discussion with a friend of mine because he was making fun of somebody who had a pet tarantula. And the person with the pet tarantula kept talking to the pet tarantula. And and my friend was like, the tarantula can't hear you. And I'm like, yes, it can. It's covered in hairs, man. I'm totally sensitive to everything that's going on. It just doesn't have ears. Its whole body is an ear. Like spiders aren't watching you. They're listening to you and smelling you. See how this looks. I'll get a little fiber mesh going here. Let's do a few more up here. Here's a case we're going to turn on symmetry and have kind of a ring of hair as it go around the outside of the eyes. One thing that I haven't modeled is the mouth parts here. I mean, I've got mandibles, but there should be more mouth parts, so I'll probably get to that in a future live stream. But I felt like detailing tonight, so that's what I'm working on. Okay, so I have this, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go down to masking, and I'm going to choose mask by color, mask by intensity, and then I'll go in here to the subtools and turn off polypaint and switch to color so now you can see that in each one of those little dots I have a mask so now what I can do is go in here to uh, fiber mesh wherever it went fiber mesh there we go and if I do preview of course I'm gonna get this which is not what I want so let's go over to this mandible here and uh, it's not far off let's try this I'm gonna go here preview um, it doesn't allow me to copy, but I can save, so I'll just save this as, I don't know. Fiber wasp, whatever, it doesn't really matter. And let's turn off preview, go back here, and I'm going to choose open, 
fiber wasp. There we go. Something like that. And maybe let's increase the max fibers a little bit. That's too much. Right now, that's looking pretty good. Okay, and I'm going to choose accept. Go to that sub tool, that fibers. Let's rename this. I'll call this head fibers. And let's get ourselves a groom brush. The other thing I want to do is I want to test this out. I'm going to do solo. And uh, let's say we decide this white color here, so it's easy to see. Let's say we have just, we want to prune some individual hairs. We should be able to do this. I should be able to go into uh, Z Modeler, hover over a face, choose delete, and let me see. I don't want to do all polygons. I do let's see if we should be able to do an island, right? Let's see if that'll work. Yeah, that allows me to go in here, and I can now I can delete individual hairs. If I feel like there's too many coming out of one spot, like right here. I mean, this is a little tedious, but it depends on how picky you are. The other option, of course, is I could spend more time on um, more time on my settings here, but I just thought I'd demonstrate that. I'm going to hover over this edge here and set the edge option to do nothing. And the point option, the same thing, so that I'm only doing this point option. Let's set that to do nothing. So that way, if you go in here, maybe delete a few of these if I don't like them. So I just wanted to demonstrate that. I'm going to go back to my groom brush here and wherever it went. Uh, did that. Interesting. Okay, so I think. Okay, well, learn something new. I think in doing that, by deleting those points, I have destroyed the fiber mesh's tendency to stick to the surface. So let's see if that's true. Let's go back a little bit. Yeah, so maybe don't go in and delete individual fiber meshes because if you do that, apparently it, it turns into regular polygons and when I try and use the groom brush, it actually just moves them away. So don't do that. Don't delete individual ones with the Z modeler brush until you're done grooming. <laughs> they can even sense your iPhone focusing on them for a picture because of LiDAR based focus. Huh, that's interesting. They can also sense your thoughts and beam advertisements into your dreams. You know somebody somewhere is figuring out how to put ads in your dreams, right? 
It must be. okay looks they look a little bit thick so I'd almost feel like going back to the preview that I'm gonna delete this because I don't like it go back to here go back to that preview of fiber mesh and I'm going to make these a bit thinner Yeah, that's more like what I want. I thought they were a little bit too thick. And then I'm going to bring down the max fibers again. Now I'll choose accept and see how that looks. I think that's better. Yeah, that's much better. going on here. Kind of cool. So what I think I'm going to do is uh, I might work on this other mandible offline and then continue with the detailing next week and also doing a little bit more of the um, adding some hair here and there, just using similar techniques. I think that's pretty cool. I think for, if I do a final render of this, well, I'm going to do a final render of this using Redshift for ZBrush once I get to the point of poly painting and all that kind of good stuff. So I might save the uh, rest of the fiber mesh and the hair work for the very end, just so I can keep going with some of the, uh, the sculpting. So, um, I think... That's where I'm going to leave off this week and next week, um, Wednesday night, it should be Wednesday night, 7.30 Pacific. Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at bluepatone01. My website is www.bluepatone.com. And um, be sure to check out some of the Noman Workshop videos. Also, uh, some of the previous live streams using this particular model uh, if you want to see how I got to this point and some of the techniques that I've shared. Um, I think it looks pretty cool. I might do a little bit of changes to this part right here because I think it looks a little dull. Maybe I'll fatten it up a little bit and add a joint or something like that because I've noticed that in some of the mud daubers. They're not always just completely thin like that. 
but otherwise I'm kind of happy with the design so far and we're going to continue next time thanks again for joining me I really appreciate it I hope you like the live stream I hope you find it interesting and I hope you more than anything you find it inspiring it's my philosophy that I think that as CG artists over the years, we've been very good at studying human anatomy. When I started, everybody was terrible at human anatomy. Now everyone's an expert at it. So we need to start bringing the same attention to other invertebrates and making sure that our creature designs uh, incorporate some science or biology based ideas in them just to, just to up the quality, always bringing it up. Um, making everything better in, within the entire CG community and the entertainment industry. Um, cool. So see you all next time. Thanks very much.